Hello everyone, glad to see you here for worship today. Let's get started with a call to worship from Psalm 89. This is Psalm 89, verse 1 through 5. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I said, steadfast love will be built up forever. In the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. You have said, I made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant. I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord. Let's worship. of mercy never cease call for songs of loudest praise teach me some melody a sonnet sung by flaming tongues above praise a mountain fixed upon mount of thy Will you pray with me? Lord, we are prone to wander. We're prone to seek out our own good. We're prone to find comfort anywhere but in you. We're prone to work for a salvation that's freely given. So we ask that you would forgive us of the times we turn from you and constantly remind us that we can do nothing to earn your grace because it was bought for us on the cross. Amen. Now let's read Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. thy faithfulness O God my Father there is no shadow of turning with thee 
Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been now for ever will be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I am needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me.
parts of my own heart would ever be full still be my vision Lord, we ask that this worship today would help to turn our minds from the worries and pursuits of this world and onto you and your perfect kingdom. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for tuning in to this week's online church service. So excited to have you here. Just want to uh, take the opportunity to be able to just welcome you to a new series. We just left the renewal series, the idea of starting the new year with God first and what God would ask each and every one of us, going through some habits that be some spiritual habits in our life that would help us to be able to draw near to him, to be able to dig deeper into what he would have for each of our lives and what he's wanting to accomplish through us and to be able to to start to replace things, some of the baggage of life and some of the things that come that would ultimately keep us away from him and some of the relationships in our life even at that. And, and so it gave us an opportunity to be able to reflect a little bit and then to move forward in some things that help us to overcome the things that come for life. And so now we're starting this new series called The Storyteller. And I want to use this to, to lead us all the way to Easter and to be ready for that, which... Uh, Storyteller series is going to be based around the parables of Jesus and, and everything that would uh, come with that and what he's trying to teach us. And, and so I hope this is a time that we get to use the parable of Jesus to see the character of God, to see uh, his heart behind things, the things that he's asking us to be as disciples and, and to, to lead us into uh, really what he would have for us coming into this spring and this season of life that's going to come here pretty soon as we start to surround ourselves by more and more people and be out a little bit more as we come to tail end of whatever season God has asked us to come out of coming into this new year. So let's start with some prayer and then we're going to dive right in today. Father God, we are so thankful, Lord, thankful every day for you to be in our lives, to stand beside us, to know that we are not alone. Lord, help us to be able to see what you would have in a message for us here today. As your word pops out to us, Lord, where we are in that and the encouragement that would come, any correction that you would ask or any inspiration that you would have for us, Lord, let us be able to do that in Jesus name. Amen. So like I said, we're starting in the parable uh, series and the idea of the storyteller. And Jesus told a lot of stories to be able to relate things, to be able to give us an idea, because the idea of picturing some of the things in heaven and some of the things he's trying to ask us to do and accomplish it, it's hard to, to wrap our minds around. And even some of his stories are, are hard still for us to wrap our minds around. But today I want to be in Matthew 20, and I want to go through verses 1 through 16. I just want to read the entire parable all the way through. And this is, this is the parable of the laborers and the vineyard. And, and this is, I think, a really great place to be able to start the parables of Jesus and shows us a picture of some of God and his character. And it picks up here in verse 1. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a, a day, which is just simply a day's wage, he sent them into the vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them, he said, you, you go into the vineyard too. And whatever, whatever is right, I will give you. So they went, going out again the sixth hour. And the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others even standing around. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. And when the evening came, the owner, said, uh, the owner of the vineyard said to the foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those who were hired at the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when the hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master's house, saying, these last, these last worked only one hour, 
And you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and scorching heat. But he replied to them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to the last worker as I gave to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first and the first last. And when we read this, we, we see that there, there's disgruntles of those who have been working all day long that end up getting paid exactly the same of those who came in at the end and only probably worked an hour of the day. And there was, there was a struggle in that because they expected more, even though this is what was agreed upon. And so we see this in life where a lot of times we, we can look around and we've done this stuff for the Lord and we've worked hard for him and things and we can develop an embitterness and a, a heart of things to look at and like, have I not been doing this longer? Have I not been doing this when no one else has come along and helped me? And then we see others. And, and when we talk about the idea of salvation in it, you know, there are those who, who find salvation early in life and their entire journey, their entire life is trying to overcome the sin of life and, and trying to walk out to a life of sanctification in the end. And then we see those who like on their deathbeds have lived, lived a life of, of whatever, and right before they pass, they give their life. And, and there's so many people that look at things like that as like an unfair thing. Like there should be more. And God is really clear that, that none of us is better than the rest. And we're all just as evil as the next. But at the same time, there's something that comes into our life that we're given. And it's the same across the board. No matter how early we get it, no matter how late. And there's a character of God in this story that I want to focus on. But before I do that, I want to share one more story with you. So somewhere around in 2000s, there's, there's an article that was written of a, of a professor in a college in Missouri. And it was, it was the end of the semester. Students were coming in for the final. And they were coming in and cramming those last minute go throughs, trying to overcome everything that was there, trying to get the last little bit of information in their mind. And so then the professor comes into the room and for a few minutes goes over some review and ultimately uh, kind of scares everyone because he responded to him and he says, this is your textbook and you're responsible for the content in this exam, for this exam. And so at that time, everyone started to get a little bit worried and they started to cram a little bit more and they tried to, to, to get as much as they could in and started to worry because they don't remember everything out of the text. They're not sure if everything's gonna be on the exam. And so it came to the point where he gives out the test upside down and he tells everyone at the same time as a timed exam, you may turn it over and begin. And when they turned it over, they couldn't believe it. They start reading and they start seeing that every answer on the test had been filled in. Even their name was written in red ink at the top of the exam. And one of them thought, you know, maybe they're the only one. So they start looking around. Then all of a sudden, everyone starts looking around, trying to figure out what is going on. And so they start looking page after page after page. And every single answer is filled in on the exam all the way through. And they all get to the last page. And this is what it said. The professor wrote a little note on the end of each page, uh, the last page. And he says, all the answers on your test are correct. You will receive an A for this final exam. The reason you passed the test is because the creator of the test took it for you. All the work you did in preparation for the test did not help you get the A. Now, consider, consider the thought process behind both of those stories and what's trying to be said. There's the story of the laborers and were paid a full day's wage even for only an hour's worth of work. And then you look at this, this test where they all received an undeserving A ultimately. And what do these stories have in common? They, they both have, this, have in common kindness. Kindness and goodness. And with the idea of kindness and goodness, you know, what does that mean in our life? What is that like for us in our life? Because each of us actually can say that we, we've had the same thing happen to us. Not one of us can ultimately say we've never been blessed with kindness or goodness of any kind. I believe if we look in our life, every single person can, can see where they've experienced outrageous, land, lavishing, unexpected, undeserving kindness at one place or another in your life. 
So what is more is we experience this actually, in my opinion, every single day is we we have this stuff poured out to us constantly. And I want to declare ultimately that we have it. And it's amazing because God is good. When we think about God's goodness, we can see God's goodness in that parable. We can see the point of goodness and kindness in, in the story of that exam. And it, if you, you want to know about God's goodness and what the goodness is that he brings to your life, all you have to do is what that first habit out of our renewal series was all about, and that was get in his word. We read in 1 Chronicles 16, 34, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. We read in Psalms 34, eight, taste and see for the Lord is good. In Psalm 100, verses 4 through 5, it says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good. We look at Moses, and he boldly pleaded with God, Please show me your glory. And so when you read in Exodus 33, ultimately what he's asking for is, is Lord, show me as much of you as I can stand. Show me as much of you as you're willing to give me. And Exodus 33, 19 through 20 says that I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim the name of Yahweh before you. See, Moses wanted to see God's glory. And God showed him something so wonderful and accessible that it caused the skin on Moses' face to glow with radiance of God's very presence in his life. He showed him his goodness. And I think that we get so wrapped up in everyday life, so wrapped up in the things of life, that we can, we can miss what true goodness is and God's goodness for us in our life. We can, we can get embittered and despised and hate and divided and, and destructive, and, and we can overcome those things in our life. But first, you have to be able to do the first thing, which is to, to identify and define God's goodness. You know, we sing about it quite often, as a matter of fact, but do you fully understand this attribute of goodness in God? You know, the Bible defines goodness several ways, in two ways, as a matter of fact. In Psalms 119.68, he says, you are good and you do what is good. So those two ways, when we look at that, the first half of the verse focuses on what God is by nature. So he is good by nature in God. And that, uh, so ultimately he is morally excellent, extraordinarily beautiful. He is unbelievably and extravagantly bountiful. He's deeply glad. And, and we're talking about God himself here. And so because we're talking of, about God himself, we, we look at it, it, his goodness is raised to the highest possible level above anything that we can even understand. I mean, think about it. The original definition of goodness is God himself. God himself is what goodness is. So goodness is an added quality to our life, but it comes natural for him because it is him. He is the definition of it. And that's exactly what Jesus meant when he said in Mark 10, 18, he said, no one is good but one, God. So we call all kinds of things good. We say that steak is good, say he's, he's a good friend, or that movie was good. But everything that we call good on earth is tainted and imperfected in some way. And God alone is goodness himself. But how do we see true character of a person? By his actions. So the second half of that, that particular scripture has a definition for God's goodness, concentrates on what he does. And so his actions are what's important. And the Bible over and over describes this point of God being kind, of God being merciful, of God being steadfast in his love, of him being generous. And God is, is ultimately given to, to human beings beyond each and every one of our deserving of anything we have. Because the only goodness in us is because it's him. It's what he's given us. It's what we're allowed to have. Have you ever thought about how generous God really is towards you? Can you believe that he looks at you with all of your baggage, all of your junk, all of your hangups, and he says, I want to be generous to you. I want to pour out to you 
what makes you happy. I want to pour out to you what you need. I want to protect you. I want to be there for you. I want to love on you with overflowing extravagance in all kinds of ways that we don't deserve. The Bible says that those are actually God's thoughts for us, that he wants to pour out goodness. He wants to generously bless us and to give us. You know, God is for you. He has your back. He is there. He's plotting to do good in your life. You, know, you are the object of his affection. You're the apple of his eye. He, he overwhelmingly has generosity to you. And sometimes we don't even notice it. But maybe, maybe today that's not where you are in life. Maybe your circumstances are really mundane. Maybe life is actually extremely hard for you. Maybe, maybe your options are really limited right now in life. And, and when, when you say God is good, maybe that's really hollow for you. Maybe that's an empty statement for you. And I want to challenge you to make a shift in your life to see things through a different lens. Because now that we've defined that, that God himself is goodness and that he wants to pour that onto us, we need to be able to look at where God reveals that in our life. Where does God reveal his goodness? And I think there's three places that we can see that. I, I believe we see it in, in natural blessings, which I think is the lesser or the lowest level in which he expresses his goodness to us, which is also the one that we tend to overlook the most or even take for granted the most. But if we read what David talks about in Psalm 145, I think it explains in verses 3 and 4, he says, Yahweh is great and is highly praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation will declare your works to the next and will pro proclaim your mighty acts. But then we see in verse 7 and 9, he says, they will give a testimony of your great goodness and will joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and great in faithful love. And notice there in verse 9, it says, The Lord is good to everyone. Well, what does that mean? That means you. That means me. That means all of us. That He, he is ultimately good to all of us. And he, he kind of follows it up and it says, His compassion rests on all he has made. He confirms that in the very next verse. That means that there's nowhere in the universe you can go that God won't be good to you. And that should be a really great settling fact in our life. And so the fact that we're all included in that. If we move down in that, in that psalm to verses 15 through 17, it says, All eyes look to you. And you give them their food in due time. You open your hand and satisfy their desires in every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and gracious in all his acts. That means every relationship, every job, every tree, every taste of food that pleases us. Every song that is sung, every friend, every flower, every field are ultimately reminders of his compassion for each and every one of us. You can look at every corner in the world, every part, every piece of every day, and there is an overflowing of his generosity to each and every one of us if we choose to see it. But you have to begin to look for it. So not only have we defined it, not only do we realize that he reveals it, that's one way. Another way he reveals it to us is through kind interventions. If you read all of Psalms 107, you can see how kind the Lord is to us in things. But I want to pull one out specifically here. It says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Let that redeemed of the Lord proclaim that he has redeemed them from the hand of the foe. And when we, we read this, there's a couple different things that the psalmist talks about that God ultimately is generously stepping towards us with things in life and his goodness and he's revealing his goodness to us if you read all of it it talks about how God comes to rescue his people who are frantically searching for something it talks about how God intervenes in the lives of those who have rebelled against him and are suffering because of it it talks about how God intervenes on behalf of his goodness in the lives of foolish people even though that they don't deserve it to help 
rescue them from sin and death. It talks about how God rescues those who continually be pounded in the storms of life. He's been there for you and more and more when you choose to see it. Because he, he has revealed through his kindness to each and every one that God is the best person to take it on. That he's the one that we should go to because of his continued kindness for each and every one of us. There's no sure source of deliverance, of rescuing or blessing other than him. And he reveals that to us because he wants to pour out on us because he is for us. And the last way he reveals that to us is, is ultimately through Jesus, through God's son, Jesus. Colossians 1 says in verse 15 is the image of the invisible God. And that in verse 19, God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. So Jesus is God's goodness in the flesh. So we have a, we have a, a human example because he was God in the flesh. So he walked that out. He was God and human at the same time. And so he demonstrates God's desire to pour out blessings and to help deliver us in several ways. The first way is he took the judgment that our sins deserved to each and every one of us. Each and every one of us deserved anything and everything that came our way. And he himself took that on. Romans 5, 8 says God pro proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So he puts his son on our behalf to take hell for us and to give us all the opportunity to believe in him and have eternity in heaven with him. Like that's a, that's a big revealing of goodness. That's a big revealing of God's hand in our lives if we choose to see it. But through Jesus, he also includes a thousand other things that are gifts of himself to us. And we know that because Romans 8.32 says he did not even spare his own son, but offered him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? So when we see that God has already shown his goodness toward us in the biggest possible way. But all the other little details of life to help you live godly life through this thick and thin are still included in that gift. He's still there helping you get through the storms. He's still helping you overcome the loss. He's still helping you find a way to sit in the repentance to gain the deliverance and the forgiveness. We have to understand that he reveals that goodness and kindness through Jesus because of that. And the last way through Jesus he does it is Jesus unlocks God's goodness towards us in new ways. We know that in 2 Corinthians 1.20, he says, every one of God's promises is yes in Christ. What that means is that God... Uh, God's good and perfect gift and his gifts of God come to us through our relationship with Jesus. So if we want to understand and appreciate God's goodness to myself, to yourself, it begins and ends with Jesus. But there's, a, there's something that has to respond on our end. We have to respond to the goodness that God offers us. So, so we define God's goodness. We see where it's revealed in our life through whether it be his kindness of blessings, through the natural blessings that come with things, but also through his son, Jesus, we have to actually have a step in his direction. And so we have to respond to his goodness and the goodness of God calls for a response. And there's, there's three steps that we have to take in our life ultimately. Romans 2, 4 says, or do you despise the riches of his kindness, restraint, patience, not recognizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. So we have to repent. We have to repent from any unbelief. We have to repent from any ingratitude in our lives. Ultimately, Paul is saying, do you think that all these blessings that you have that come every single day, that you were so nice enough and so amazing enough that you deserved every single one of them? No, his goodness was meant to lead you to him. So where are you at in life right now with that? Do you look at your blessing? Do you look at the goodness that God has revealed to you through Jesus, through his kindness, through the natural things, the natural blessings of life? Do you use those things with the intent to draw near and seek the Lord in life because he has blessed you? He is leading you to him 
or do you just sop them up? Do you just come to a place of accepting them? Going through life, you're receiving what he's been giving you without trusting in Christ. Ultimately saying, God and I had all this coming. I deserve more and more thanks and giving it. We find Jesus and we have to realize that we have to rely on him and everything is him and is his and everything we have is because of him. And because of his lavishing outpouring of the goodness that he is. So if you want to know where your heart is in that, look around you. Take a minute and, and look at the hand of the Lord in your life and turn to him today. See what he's given you as an opportunity to give to someone else, as an opportunity to use, to draw near to him. Does it lead you back to him? Now, the next step is we have to rest in his goodness when adversity comes in life. And sometimes that's hard. Sometimes we want to we want to withdraw. Sometimes we want to push ahead. Sometimes we react out of our flesh. And we can't do that. We live in a world where bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people. You know, I even know people who will question, well, if there was a God, would he let this happen? I mean, we, we argue with ourselves and our feelings and the rest. And so sometimes God's plan for us means that we're going to go through trials and hardships and losses, heartache, and even death. But if you hear anything out of my message today, hear this. God is there for you. I want to say that again. God is there for you. We have to recognize the truth in the times we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. We have to stand in what he taught us, what we know to be true, what we know to be his goodness. In Psalms 31, 19 through 20, it says, How great is your goodness that you have stored up for those who fear you and accomplished in the sight of everyone for those who take refuge, refuge in you. You hide them in the protection of your presence. You conceal them in a shelter from the schemes of men from quarrelsome tongues. And God has great goodness is stored up for you. He's giving it to you. You take refuge in him. You rest in him. He is up to more than you know. And he has hidden help that only comes from when we give everything up to him and realize that it is him who provides those things for us. And so we have to do the last step to be able to get to this point in our life. And we have to step out in faith. You know, when you believe that God is good all the time, it frees you to take an even, even larger, increasing steps to growing the capacity of what your faith really is. You, know, you think about different things God is asking you to step out in. If you step out in that, you see God work in it. It builds trust in you. And your faith grows. We want to continually do that in our life. But there's no excuse why we should not trust in the goodness that he's giving us now. Because he is for us. It should energize us. It should encourage us. It should put a, a, a serious amount of courage in us to be able to step out. Because he wants it to lead us to him. I want to end on this one last story here today because I think it really seals the point of what God's goodness is and, and gives us a picture of what that would be. There was a gentleman by the name of uh, John Gilbert, and he actually only lived to, to be 25 years old because at five years old, he was diagnosed with muscular dystrophy. And so because of that, he, he experienced a disease that ultimately took something from him every single year. So every single year, he was going to slowly deteriorate and become less and less of an ability to do the things that he did before. So there came a point where he couldn't, uh, he couldn't run anymore, and then he couldn't walk anymore, and then he couldn't stand anymore, and then he couldn't uh, run his hands anymore. And eventually, he got to a place where he couldn't even speak any longer. And so with all of that going on, he, he found himself get to a place where at 25 years old, he passes away. But in his life before he did, he was invited to a, a fundraiser somewhere. And when it began, he had his eye 
John had his eye on this specific basketball. It actually was signed by every one of the players in the Sacramento Kings at the time. And he really, really desperately wanted that ball. And so as the auction started to go, uh, he started to raise his hand. Well, his mom knew they couldn't afford any of the bids. And so she pulled it down and he raised his hand again and she pulled it down. Well, it wasn't long before the excitement of the bidding and the rest just flew through the room. And with that all coming up, they all got to a place where it was, it was really quite uh, an outrageous bid, even beyond outside the value of what the ball itself was. And so it just got more and more exciting and the bidding kept going. And finally, a gentleman stepped in and he offered a bid that was well beyond what anybody else could keep up with. And so at the end, it was going once, going twice, sold. So this gentleman walked up to claim his ball, and instead of going back to his seat, he went across the room, and he went right to where John was, and he placed that ball in front of, in the hands of John himself. Now think about this. He, he's giving this ball, this basketball, to this frail young man sitting in, in his chair, who will never dribble this basketball, who can never pass a ball, who will never take a three-point shot, and at this point can't do anything other than barely hold on to it in his life. And, and it was a moment that this man realized it didn't matter because this young man would treasure that gift the rest of his life. And this is what John Gilbert wrote because he still had some ability of this before he lost it. He said, it took me a moment to realize what the man had done. I remembered hearing gasps all around the room, then thunderous applause and weeping eyes. To this day, I am amazed. Have you ever been given a gift that you could have never gotten for yourself? Has anyone ever sacrificed a huge amount for you without getting anything in return? And I think every one of us if we're honest with ourselves, have to sit right where we are, and the answer to that question for us is absolutely yes. Because when you think about the overall gift of the sacrifice of God's Son, Jesus Christ, for our salvation, we we're given a gift that we cannot, we can't buy, that we don't deserve, that we can't attain on our own. And it was given to us because of the goodness that God brings. And that's my prayer for everyone here today, that you would realize the goodness and the outpouring that God has on your life. And it would spur you on to be who he's created you to be. Let's pray. Father God, I am so thankful. I am so thankful for your son Jesus to die on the cross, for you to empower him by raising him three days later, Lord. That he is our example, that he is our way. And Lord, I ask that you would make each and every one of us, Lord more like him each day. Help us to be who you've called us to be and us to recognize the goodness that only comes because it is you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks for tuning in this week. Hope to see you next week.